and we are live. It's Dr. J here in the house. Make sure you feel free and smash that like button. Hit that bell. Really helps the YouTube algorithm. Let's dive in. We're going to be talking about SIBO and histamine intolerance. I did a nice little podcast on this topic this week as well as a histamine podcast last week. So make sure you click down below to get access to those great podcasts. Hit that bell notification so you get updates on future content coming your way. So off the bat, let's dive in. SIBO. SIBO is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So when you have an imbalance in bad bacteria, more more bad bacteria than good bacteria, lots of different things happen. Number one, we're more prone to having food intolerances or food allergens. So we may be consuming foods that are already allergenic like grains or dairy or bad junky fats that could be creating a allergenic immune response where you're one have making antibodies to that food though that antibody interaction with the food creates inflammation number two it creates gut barrier permeability so those foods can get into the bloodstream you can have more of an autoimmune like response Number two is you're going to have a harder time digesting and breaking down the food. So that means you have functional nutritional deficiencies. And number three, that food that you're consuming is now rotting, putrefying, fermenting in your gut. So you may have gases and disruption and motility either on the extreme constipation side or on the extreme diarrhea side. And that's going to affect absorption. And of course, when your bowels go too slow, you're going to potentially reabsorb a lot of toxins from your stool. This is called auto intoxication. And those toxins could be stressful on your body, on your immune system, and on your detoxification system. Now, histamine is interesting. It's actually a neurotransmitter. It's going to happen or it's going to be produced from histidine. And it's produced by your mast cells or your basophils, which are Basically, mast cells are basophils that leave the bloodstream and go into the tissue. And histamine is part of the immune response. It's there to help with vasodilation, opening up the blood vessels so we can get white blood cells in there to clean up whatever's going on. So acutely, this makes sense. But the problem is people that have histamine issues, it tends to be more of a chronic issue. So like your typical histamine issues may be like redness of the skin, hives, uticaria, it could be brain fog, it could be headaches especially when you see higher histamine foods commonly driving it like chocolate or coffee or fermented foods or aged meats or citrus foods, right? These are gonna be common foods that are higher in histamine. If you're noticing a correlation with these foods over something else, there could be a histamine issue. Now, we do know that inflammation in the gut is gonna predispose those mast cells to make more histamine. So the more we have bad bacteria in the gut, or CFO, small intestinal fungal overgrowth, or even a gut infection, there's a greater chance that we're gonna have more immune response, that our immune system is more on high alert because of the inflammation in our gut. So we gotta do our best to kind of get the food under control. We may look at those higher histamine foods like I mentioned earlier. Now, there's higher histamine foods like the citrus, like the fermented foods. We can have probiotic intolerance. This is common in SIBO. Uh, Avocados, tomatoes. uh, These are going to be histamine, high histamine foods. We also have histamine releasing foods. This causes us to release more histamine. And then we have the DAO blocking foods. These are going to be like our energy drinks, our teas, and they're going to block the enzyme DAO, diamine oxidase, which helps metabolize histamine. So if you have a histamine issue, yeah, histamine may be an issue, but you're going to have to look deeper at the guts. You're going to have to look at infections and digestive issues. Now in that podcast, we go a lot deeper into these topics. So click down below to get access to that podcast link. So we we have a 30 minute dialogue on that. So this is gonna be a little bit shorter. This kind of gives you a broad overview of what's going on and what to look forward to in that longer podcast. I'm going to open it up to some questions if we have any on the topic of SIBO and histamine. Let's see what I got here. Anything off the bat. So someone had a question about dealing with or protecting themselves from pastorella. We can just kind of talk about bacterial issues in general. Well, number number one, it depends on where what food may be the driving factor. So obviously try to eat foods that are on the cleaner side, right? Not you know not questionable foods. Number two, make sure we have enough hydrochloric acid or enzymes to be able to break down that food, right? Not being able to have enough enzymes or acids could be a problem, could put stress on our digestive system. And Number three is we can also take activated charcoal with it if it's a questionable food. So if we want to have some extra binding capacity, we can do that as well. And we may also use extra clearing herbs, extra antimicrobial herbs to help kind of knock down any bacteria, whether it's Campylobacter or E. coli or Salmonella, right? These are common bacterial 
issues like that you see in food poisoning. So if we want to be preventative on that, then we can take some of those herbs as well. But a lot of times just the digestive support, maybe some charcoal could be enough to kind of help keep that under control. All right. And then in general, what are tests that we can do to look deeper at histamine issues? Well, there are some histamine urine tests that can be done. Again, the better test is, hey, you have symptoms, let's cut out the histamine foods, the histamine releasing foods, the DAO blocking foods. How do you feel? Okay, you feel good. Let's add some of those foods back in. How do you feel? Not so good. Okay, so we kind of established a cause and effect relationship with histamine and food. So that's kind of a better way to go because it's it's free and it's palpable. Like when you feel that difference and you feel that change, you know what the deal is, right? Number two, we may want to look deeper at the gut because like I mentioned, bacterial overgrowth could play a big role in that immune response and those mast cells just swelling up and accumulating histamine. So we may look at a stool test, like a GI map test to look at what kind of dysbiotic bacteria is present. We may want to look at a breath test to see what's going on with the methane and hydrogen gases. Again, that's an indirect test, but we know bad bacteria will make let's say methane, more methane or more hydrogen over a certain point, it tells us it's probably pathological, right? Greater than 15 to 20 on the hydrogen or three or so on the methane or greater than 20 total is a pretty good idea that we're going to have some bacterial issues. And we may even look at organic acids because the organic acids are nice because we get a window into different bacterial overgrowth markers like indicin and hipparate uh, and benzoate, which are great. We may even look at um, D-arabinitol, which is a really good fungal marker as well. So we can get a good window of what's happening underneath the hood. I mean, you can look at candida markers via the blood. That can be a nice one to look at. It may not be necessary, as a lot of times you may pick it up in the stool or the urine, but it can always be something decent if we have chronic fungus to kind of rule that out. Nice to look at that. And then, of course, we got to make sure our digestion is on track, because if we're not digesting food well, Let's say we see a lot of indican. Indican a lot of times can mean there's increased putrefied protein. And if we're not breaking down protein, then that's creating stress in the gut, right? Food that sits in our tummy and burns and, and creates stress means we're probably not extracting a lot of the nutrients out of that food too. All makes sense, but what to do first? If suspecting can't digest well, ACV burns, but no ulcers, have started cabbage juice, but on low carb, um, what to do when coughing, headaches still persist. So it's hard because there's a lot of symptoms that overlap, right? Especially if you're a female, a lot of times headaches and some of these issues could correspond with your female hormone imbalance. Especially if you're cycling, you may see it cyclically, you know, a week before menstruation or into menstruation. So it really depends upon kind of where you're at hormonally, what sex you are as well. Um, women, if we see it cyclically, we're thinking this could be a hormone issue, right? There could also be an adrenal component with the hormones because we know that the more estrogen dominant we are, progesterone tends to drop, right? And that drop in progesterone, it's typically because the adrenals are pulling that progesterone to make cortisol, right? Progesterone is a precursor to our stress hormones. So then as you become more estrogen dominant, you almost always have more adrenal stress that's driving it. So you have to look at both sides of it. But of course, start with the foods and start with the digestive support. Again, we have a lot of videos and articles on the six R's. Remove the bad foods, replace the enzymes, repair the hormones and the gut lining, remove the infections, repopulate, re-inoculate good bacteria, retest. That's the sequence. Barb writes in, hey, Barb, hope you're doing well. How do histamine symptoms present when we are found on our body? Um, are we seeing skin symptoms, internal pains, gas? So on your body, you're going to see hives typically. So if you Google like hives or you to carry, that's a good um, sign that there could be a histamine issue. You could have brain fog, headaches. It just depends. You really want to look at histamine foods as being a driving factor to that. As I mentioned in the more comprehensive podcast, um, Food allergens like to grains or other foods could also drive similar symptoms. So there's a big kind of a, if you look at a Venn diagram, there's a big overlap in what those symptoms are. So you want to see if you can notice a cause and effect to those higher histamine foods. Add it in. Do you see it come back? Pull it out. Do you see it go away? Add it back in. Do you see it come back a little? So you want to kind of establish that cause and effect. Also, would you prefer your patients do before consulting you? Is there kind of baseline that you'd like us to go before calling on an expert like you? It just really depends kind of where you're at. A lot of people that have already reached out to me have already done some things diet-wise. So if, our, if you've already kind of worked on some of the low-hanging fruit diet-wise, I think that's a good first step. And then to reach out to me after, I think that's a really good place to do. 
place to start at least. That's great. Excellent. All right. Any other questions at all, feel free to let me know. Also, if you have a histamine issue or SIBO issue, put your comments down below what you've experienced, what's worked for you, what's helped for you, any diet strategies or techniques or specific supplements that move the needle at all for you. Please let me and the listeners know. All right. Anything else, please feel free. I'll give you guys another couple of seconds to check in on that. All right, so in regards to histamine, um, there are more expensive tests that can be done. Not a huge fan of it. I think figure out the foods connected to the symptoms and start from there. Uh, Sonia wrote in, how do I cut my estrogen dominance? <clears throat> also repeated mold infections. Why I've completed seven cell core, three phases since 2017, what to do more. So we talked a lot about the, the mold component with histamine because mold issues will make histamine sensitivity worse histamine sensitivity will go up the more inflammation there is so the thing is histamine like reducing histamine may actually be an effect not a, let me say it again reducing histamine may be more palliative meaning it may not be the root cause right the root cause could be a gut infection with mold exposure that could be the root cause but the but those two things are making you more histamine sensitive right so you may be reducing histamines in your food it may be having a palliative effect because you're not addressing the mold you're not addressing the gut issue so just kind of keep an eye out i always draw a line some people reducing histamine in the foods is more root cause some of it's more palliative either way if it allows you to feel better that's a good first step while we get to the root cause so when I'm dealing with patients, I always draw a line in my head. Is this root cause? Is this more palliative? And if it's palliative, nothing wrong with it. We have to make sure that we are adding in root cause care in conjunction. And then regarding estrogen dominance, we'd have to test that and know that for sure. And then make sure the adrenals are being supported because usually it's the adrenal stress that's um, when, the, when you're estrogen dominant, it's usually there's a lot of adrenal stress happening to drive that. So we have to support both. In the past, I do get excess uh, herbs like ginger. Uh, I get excess OG herbs like ginger, coconut, different types of herbs for weight loss. But after that, I got infections, two bacteria diagnosed, staph aureus, and blasto. God, I don't see a question there. Uh, suspecting histamines for boyfriend. He has a great diet, low carb, cruciferous, but energy is very low. He also has headaches and anxiety, coughing, congestion, as well as body seems to love uh, horseradish. Okay, interesting. Uh, what to do with these pathogens, bacteria, parasites, uh, infections, so they don't develop resistance against these herbs and the infections never come back and completely heal ourselves. So to prevent basically resistance, we want to come in there with enough herbs that can knock it out ideally the first time around. We want to make sure that we know what's going on. So if we think it's one thing, but it's bacteria and parasites, <clears throat> we want to make sure we adjust the protocol to what's going on in the gut. And we sequence it accordingly, and then we wanna make sure we retest. There's always a 70 to 80% chance we'll knock it out first round, meaning 20 to 30% we need another round or two. So we wanna make sure we know that, we treat, we use different herbs to prevent resistance, and then we retest to ensure we knocked it out. Thanks, do you help men with low testosterone in the 300 level? Yeah, all the time. Gotta fix the underlying stressors that led to it, but yep, absolutely. All right, any other questions, let me know. If not, you guys have a phenomenal day. Check out the podcast. I'll put the link down below. Head over to justinhealth.com. Click on the podcast link to get access to the newest info. And make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel. You'll see it there as well. All right, y'all, you guys have a phenomenal day. We'll talk soon. Take care.